Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to NBCA's uh, first pep talk for 2023. We're super excited to be back with everybody tonight. Uh, I'm joined tonight with my fellow pepper, uh, Todd Robertson, and we are here also with Heidi Beinro from Aiken Gump. Uh, tonight's topic, as you all know, is learn how to take action and advocate to help stop the clot. So this is an extremely um, important event for us tonight and potentially a big game changer for the National Blood Clot Alliance and the patient community overall. Um, we want to let you know that there is going to be a link tonight for people to participate um, after tonight's call so that you can actually join us to take, uh, to take action. And um, so be on the lookout, please, for that link. We'll be sharing that with everybody. And um, so as I mentioned, I'm here with Todd and Heidi. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on Heidi. Some of you know her already because she's already joined us a few times uh, on our PEP events. But um, Heidi is a senior policy advisor at uh, Aiken Gump in Washington, D.C. Uh, she works extensively on regulatory and congressional issues involving health policy in the public and private sectors. Uh, she advises clients in regulatory reform and reimbursement strategies involving coding, coverage, and payment for medical device companies, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies, providers, and national healthcare associate associations. Um, she has been in the industry for a very long time. She started out as a staff member for Senator John McCain in Arizona, uh, and she um, has particular experience in the pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device sector, and we are so privileged and honored to have you with us tonight. And on behalf of all of us at NBCA, thank you, Heidi, for leading this discussion uh, this evening. Uh, before we get going, we're going to do our usual poll questions. Uh, it'll just be uh, one time tonight at the beginning and not at the end. And I'm going to turn that over to Todd for the poll questions. Thanks, Leslie. I'm uh, really excited about this. So if you guys could answer these real quick. Question number one, have you ever reached out to your local representative? Yes or no? And by the way, if you have, we're going to follow up with you and find out who it was you reached out to and the process that you uh, uh, went through to make that happen. Question two, if you have not, why not? I don't know my local rep I don't know who my local representative is. I don't know how to contact my local representative. It's too overwhelming. I don't even know where to start or other. So those are the questions. If you could uh, answer those real quick, we'll go ahead and uh, go over uh, the results. I'm anxious. Don't see anything popping up yet. Nope. Oh, there we there go. We so uh, answer for, have you ever reached out to your local representative? 23% said yes. So I, I knew it was gonna be uh, on the low end, but I am happy to see that a lot of you have reached out and 77% said no. And for our second question, if no, why not? 15% said, I don't know who my local representative is. 31% said, I don't know how to, <clears throat> excuse me, contact my local representative. 31% also said, it's just too overwhelming. I don't know even know where to start and we may be able to help you tonight. And 38% said other. So thank you for answering the questions. Again, if you said that you reached out to a representative, we're gonna probably be reaching out to you to find out who you uh, contacted in the process. Leslie. Great, thanks Todd. So. 31% said, I don't know how to contact my local representative. And an additional 31% or 31% also said it's too overwhelming. I don't know where to start. We're hoping by the end of tonight, we're gonna take care of all of those issues for you and you'll be ready to rock and roll with NBCA. Yeah. Okay, so our objective here tonight with Heidi um, is to really learn how to use our voices, both individually and collectively, and to advocate uh, to Congress so that for the first time ever, there could be dedicated funding for blood clot education and awareness. Um, we know that there is very little funding available and none of it is actually dedicated specifically to blood clots. Uh, and we need to change that and we can change that. So Heidi, before we get started, um, can you share also why this is with the audience, why this is so personal for you? And then I gave a, a, a little bit of a background blip on you, but in layman's terms, really explain what you do in DC. Sure, Leslie, and you know, thank you again 
Leslie, Todd, Julia, Taryn, it's it's been delightful working with you over this past year and the National Blood Clot Alliance. Um, so as Leslie mentioned, uh, this is very personal for me, and that is actually a really good reason to advocate because it is personal. Um, I am a blood clot survivor myself. I have survived two PEs as well as several blood clots. The last one being um, when I had my son eight years ago, um, I, I, I got another blood clot. I thought I had gotten past it, but uh, unfortunately I, I did not. But um, luckily I, I did have very good resources available to me. Um, I'm sure you uh, may recall in my last pep talk, my brother is a doctor. So he also helps me um, make sure that the care I receive is the care I need, but I know that not everybody has that same ability and that same access. And working with NBCA, I want to make sure that everyone has that ability to receive education on what a blood clot is and what to look out for and how it can save your life, because it certainly did save mine many times over. Um, you know, as we're thinking through about advocacy, I admitted, you know, we could tell a couple jokes, right, about lobbyists, and um, it's it's very similar to lawyers, um, you know, uh, but I, I won't go that far because it is important. It is important to be an advocate, and it's even more important to be an advocate for public health. As we all saw through COVID, our public health capabilities are pretty abysmal, and it was discussed in various capacities every day on Capitol Hill and the White House and federal agencies and states and local decision makers. What happened? Where did the chain break down? What was the issue? And it really was, there were not many resources for public health officials and there wasn't much in education. Um, federal agencies weren't sure how to get the message out quickly. And I think that COVID really showed the importance of consistent advocacy for disease indications, for health conditions, for social determinants of health, how are people living, and that really does um, happen with the voice of the public. So we joke that those of us inside the Beltway, so I spend most of my time, as Leslie said, I like to call it my day job. I work with a lot of innovative companies to make sure that they can get their technologies to those who are in need. And through that, working on uh, technology for blood clot removal is how I met Leslie and the National Blood Clot Alliance. Even myself, as an advocate every day, did, was not aware that these you know, educational materials were available. And we want to be sure that, again, every hospital, every local community, everyone has, you know, this opportunity to understand what is best for them and what is best for public health. So um, it does start with, you know, having lots of conversations and really advocating on your behalf what is the problem? You know, being an advocate is far reaching. It has, you know, a number of po you know positive impact. And we do like to make positive impact. And I'm not sure, Leslie, if, if you want to talk about the positive impact we had in the most um, uh, in the recent passage of the omnibus that happened here in December. Maybe some of you have followed the uh, budgetary process here in DC. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure everyone did. But we were able, through the appropriations process, that certainly is the process that funds the government, that we were able to raise awareness for blood clots. So that was a huge win because, again, it's in print, it's black and white, it goes to the agencies, and it expresses con Congress's desire to have more written materials and more education around the impact of blood clots. Heidi, so, can I just interject for a second? I just want everybody out there to know that this is the first time ever that NBCA, with your assistance, was actually able to get this type of language uh, in the budget, um, basically uh, telling the agencies that they needed to start focusing on blood clot education and awareness. And so, you know, it's the first step in a very long process, but it's the first step that we took ever. And we're we're just so excited to continue this process. So thank you. Yeah, and, and really, um, the legislative process can be long and complex. And I know that 
there are a number of complaints that, you know, there isn't being anything done in Washington. And that may be true for some things, but it's not true for other things. And if effective advocacy does not have to be a long and complex process. You know, advocates um, that are touting public health expertise and all of you on the call in the webinar today are public health experts. You have had or a caregiver or a family member or someone you know has been in a situation where they needed help, they needed medical help, and that is a public health issue. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as you're vital to the process, you know, again, we only react most often here in Congress. So it really is through meeting with your members of Congress, writing letters, and, and I'm happy to get into some more of those details. But I cannot stress how important it is, because that's how members learn. That's how congressional members learn, excuse me. And that's how staff learns. And that's how we make change. But we can't make change if members are not hearing from their constituents. And that really is where you all come in. Yeah, great point. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Heidi. And I just wanna say that I am so appreciative of what you and the rest of the team at, at Aiken Gump um, has, what you've given us over the past year as far as an education on how we can better be advocates and, and talk to Congress. I gotta tell you, even though, you know, we were unable to be in DC last year in person. That's gonna change this year. I'm really excited about uh, coming in March. Um, but it was, I, I never had so much fun talking to all these important people in DC because I found out that, you know what? They, they do wanna hear your story. And then we found out so many of them have, have known someone in their family that have suffered a blood clot and it just started a chain reaction and that would have not been possible without you guys. So thank you so much for what you do. Um, as Leslie said, you know, our, excuse me, uh, our main goal uh, for tonight is we want you to educate all those who are watching, all those who are going to watch the recording of this, because there are going to be thousands. We want you to educate us on what the process is, how it works. So if you could walk us through how we navigate the House and the Senate in order to secure funding. But it's not all just about funding, right? It's about raising awareness and saving maximum lives. We know that less than 6% of Americans even know what VTE is, which is a DVT or a PE. And, and that's, uh, when you think about it, that's crazy. O only, you know, 6% or less. So, mm -hmm. and that includes Congress and, and their staff as well, as I mentioned. So can you kind of explain to everybody what the process looks like and how we go about doing that with Congress? Sure, and, and Todd, I, I like to give the example because again, I, I want folks to understand that, you know, while members of Congress have a job to do on Capitol Hill, they do have very strong staff. Mm -hmm. And these staff members are, you know, taking in all this information. And I would be remiss to remember the one meeting we had with a young staffer and she was pregnant and she had no idea that she was at risk for blood clots and her eyes just got wider and wider. And, and at the end of the meeting, she said, thank you. I will go back to my OBGYN and make sure that, you know, I am looking for the signs and symptoms. So again, just one conversation changed one life and she did reach out afterwards. She had a very healthy baby and she did not have any complications, but it was one less thing that she had to worry about. So okay. again, you're making a difference in individual lives as well as, you know, massive amount of lives around the United States. Um, so I'm happy to, I, I put together some slides. We don't necessarily have to go through all of them, um, but just again, some tips and tricks when, you know, you're meeting with representatives and legislators and why it's so important. So as Todd said, usually pre-COVID and hopefully now in 2023, really um, what we most often do is meet face-to-face. -face. And that really is the most effective way to inform and influence le legislators and especially their staff. Because again, members are kind of coming in and out. They are working on a lot of you know, different issues you know, but you begin to build relationships, you are presenting opportunities to educate 
you know, again, most of these folks don't know what you know, and it is their job to listen to you. You are their constituent. You voted them in. I hope everyone votes. Please, please use your voice to vote as well. But again, this is your right as an advocate. Um, I think there's more detail than the next slide, Julia. So this is my favorite. So one of the um, most favorite Speaker of the House, maybe some of you remember uh, good old Tip O'Neill way back in the day. His most famous statement was really the observation that all politics is local. And it truly is. I know that everyone thinks that everything that goes on here in, inside the Beltway, as we call it, is just you know where a lot of the big decisions are happening, but actually most of it is very local. Grassroots is key. It really starts more often than not with a personal issue, a personal story. And so more often than not, what we see, especially in this kind of advocacy work where you're really, you know, it's a public health issue, you are trying to raise awareness, is you are relaying your personal story as much as you feel comfortable with to either the member of Congress, you meet him in the grocery store, or you um, see him on the golf course, or, you know, there are plenty of ways to engage both locally in your own congressional district, as well as in DC, if you do choose to come and participate in advocacy on Capitol Hill. But again, it starts with the story. And that's where Todd and Leslie, you know, really get folks attention. Well, what are you here to talk about? I'm here to talk about blood clots. Okay, that seems odd. Well, I almost died. Oh, okay, let me lean in. What happened? Well, this is what happened. And this is what didn't happen. And if I did have, you know, more education, or if I did have awareness, or if my nurse had awareness, or if somebody else in the medical chain had awareness, maybe this wouldn't happen to me. And you certainly don't want it to happen to other member or other, you know, um, constituents in your district. And a lot of that does trickle down to just better public health, as well as a financial impact. You know, again, we keep people healthy, we keep them out of the hospital. So really personalizing the issue. Don't be afraid to tell your full personal story, because again, they are here to listen to you and they are there to try to make things better. So oftentimes we've seen based on personalizing issues where, you know, a member of Congress will be at a hospital and be like, hey, you know, I had this constituent and this happened and it starts change where they're like, oh, well, you know, because again, now you've got a member of Congress and some press looking at the head of hospital and they're like, oh, well, perhaps we should change our intake process or perhaps we should include that on a form when folks come in and boom, that's how change starts happening. But also, you know, it can't all just rely on the personal story. There do have to be some data, some examples, like why the need for public education, what is the need for awareness? And as Leslie said, many are not aware that this is not a separate bucket at CDC. This is not a separate bucket in any federal agency. So what happens is a big chunk of money is sent to the CDC and then CDC chooses to dole it out in the way they see fit. And what we do when we advocate is we ensure that any funding that goes for public education and awareness for blood clots goes to that issue. And that's what this report language did in the last omnibus. It is indicating to the federal agency, hey, we're giving you money and we want you to use it in this way because this is important to Congress. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, yeah. Leslie, Todd, maybe, you know, if any questions? Yeah. Yeah, it makes it makes total sense. I have a question for you, and I know you don't work at a government agency, but how does that process then work in terms of they've gotten a communication from Congress, we want you to do the following. How does the how does the funding then actually end up uh, into the organizations like us who actually provide education mm -hmm. and awareness in initiatives? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of federal agencies can't do it alone. So much of the money that's allocated to these entities have to be shared with um, the public. So there are public-private stakeholders, and that's generally done through opportunities of grant, grant money. 
Um, some of the monies is, is flowed through the federal agency of whatever agency it's allocated to and then to the states. So it gets disseminated among the states and then whomever wants to um, uh, apply for a grant through the state, it can. This is a little bit different because again, CDC does you know, lead on public education. And so um, they rely on entities like the National Blood Clot Alliance, because you are the patient community, where do we need to spend more of our resources? And they do that working with you and then providing grant monies to you. So it's really important then as we communicate to Congress and as people join us from the community to advocate um, that we're very clear that we want this to be used for education and awareness efforts going forward. Correct. Yes. And um, interestingly enough, federal agencies cannot lobby for their own money. So um, it really does make sense for communities and patients and interested stakeholders and providers to do the heavy lifting of that advocacy work. Because again, CDC and others um, cannot ask for more that. monies from, from the Congress. Okay. Uh, Todd, any questions on your side before we move forward? Uh, no, I think I think Heidi, I think you you nailed it on the head, and um, I just think it's really good information. And I've got some more questions later on in in, in the episode, but no, I, I think that sounded great. Thank you. So I have to say, a year ago at this time, I had absolutely no clue how any of this worked. And if you had said to me, "Your voice is important. Your patient story. Your personal patient story." is important and it's meaningful, I probably would have not laughed, but I would have been like, uh, sure it is. So mm -hmm. I want to come back to that for a, a little bit just so you can maybe walk us through it a little bit more and maybe give you some, some illustrations and maybe we can talk about somebody who might be helping us in the state of New York and a personal story uh, around that. You know, we hear a lot that our voice doesn't matter and that's just not true. So Heidi, hey, walk us through the congressional members and their teams you know, why they want to hear these patient stories, why these stories are so powerful, you know, and how do we actually take people's stories that maybe aren't working in NBCA, but are kind of out in the community, and how do we roll this into the NBCA voice so that we do have strength in numbers? Because it's really important that all the individuals kind of roll up into one big group uh, as we move forward in March to advocate for, for funding. Yeah, sure. And I think I have some of that on the next slide, Julia. So, you know, how 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 do you get engaged? And and it is, um, and it's not easy, you know, when when you don't know the process and and what's the right thing to say and and who do you call it and how to start. Mm -hmm. So I think that the best place to start really is volunteering with the National Blood Clot Alliance. You know, again. Um, folks uh, have about a year of this under their belt. They certainly do understand how to advocate. And given the number of meetings we've had with several different types of members of Congress, and of course we are bipartisan when we do this advocacy, because again, public health impacts us all, um, is that um, you know the personal story again draws folks in. It's like, okay, well, you know, you, you took the day off work and, and you came into my office and, and why specifically? And, and when you tell your story, they're like, okay, well, we can see why you're part of this organization, but, you know, what's helpful? And that's really the part of the story that, you know, if I had known sooner, if I had seen a flyer, or if I could have given my dad a flyer, or if I could have gone on CDC's website and gotten more information, or, you know, I don't know where to turn. That's where a member of Congress can be helpful. And they can say, okay, well, now we know that, you know, this is not trickling down to my, you know, district. And, you know, similar to COVID, it's libraries, it's churches, it's, you know, your local community centers, it's bulletin boards, where a lot of folks get their information, nursing home bulletin boards, etc. But again, those documents don't come free. And, you know, a lot of that to be um, information that's trusted should come from the CDC. And that's what the CDC is trying to do. But the member of Congress won't know if no one tells them, you know, mm -hmm. so 
Again, members of Congress have staff both in their district as well as in Washington, D.C., and based on what, you know, issues the personal member is interested in, they do cover all issues. So there is someone in the office that, you know, certainly understands health care. They understand public health because, again, that's a federally funded program. So you need congressional um, uh, attention to move that forward. And admittedly, you know, when we come to D.C., and I think everyone's a little bit shocked, the staff are young. They're, they're young professionals, um, many recently out of college or their graduate program. So you kind of walk in with this, uh, do I want to tell this 25-year-old about my blood clot issue? Yes. One, because they're whip smart. They got to D.C. for a reason. And these folks know their stuff and they've got big dreams. So they're, you know, they have a lot of influence within their own office and with their own member. They will be your voice to the member of Congress as well. So you got to draw them in. You got to make them engaged. You got to force them to engage. So don't be deterred just because of, you know, wow, well, my, or my member of Congress is new. You know, he was just, he or she was just elected. Good. They don't have a full plate. They got plenty of time to listen to you. So give them a call, right. you know? So um, that is certainly something that the National Blood Clot Alliance and we at Aiken Gump as pro bono counsel can help with, you know, making sure that folks are connecting in a way that is helpful. And if you don't know what to say, that's great. We, we can help or you don't know who to send it to, no problem. I got all their phone numbers. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, and it doesn't have to be just in DC. And I think that some of the conversation here is, is that members in DC are a little crazed. It's very busy, it's very hectic. A lot of things are happening. I'm sure everybody saw what happened in DC last week with, you know, the house trying to vote in the speaker. But when they're home, they're much more relaxed. And the one thing they love to do is talk to constituents when they're home. So many of them have local town hall meetings. So if you need help finding your local member, we can certainly point you in the right direction. It is based on the zip code of where you live. And they have coffee. They usually meet in local diners or they'll meet in their local office. They'll have it in the mornings or on weekends. And it's a great way with no monies involved to be able to interact with your member, which again, you know, is really based on your personal story and the need for more public education. And finally, if you want to come and see the great capital, we are open finally here in Washington, <laughs> D.C. And we can go in now, which is thrilling for those of us who haven't been able to really go all the time in the last few years. So, you know, March, we'd like to dedicate that to blood clot awareness. And I know Leslie will talk a little bit more about that. But if you're able to and um, you'd like to come to D.C. and you can meet with members and staff in person and you can tell your story and it's a great day. It's a lot of walking and we'll talk more about that, too. But there are so many ways to engage that do not cost any money, that do not take up a lot of time, writing letters, sending emails, making phone calls. Yeah. And, you know, I was one of those people when you first started to introduce me to folks and I was like. I have to tell my personal story to a complete stranger who's 27 years old. I was so taken aback by it. But then by the end of the conversation, I was so thankful for the opportunity and they were so engaged in what I was saying. And they were so eager to learn because nobody had educated them before. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually a really great experience. And we just continued to build and build and build. I never felt as though somebody didn't want to listen to what we were saying. I actually felt as though they were super engaged and really wanted to work with us. So yeah, the whole grassroots and Todd is like the king of grassroots. Um, but uh, any questions, hit us up. We're there to, we're there to answer them. Todd. Yeah, you, you know, it's, uh, I, I follow a, a lot of people just on Twitter. Um, a lot of my local politicians, they're very active in Twitter. And just recently I saw somebody, uh, one of the local, one of the local politicians is having uh, kind of an open house at a blues concert and just saying, hey, come on, come on down and, and let's talk. And guess what? I'm going down. I'm going to a blues concert. And I fully <laughs> intend on if I can just get their ear and start talking. I may not talk like a politician, but I talk as much as a politician. I love talking <laughs> about blood clots, not not 
just not my experience. I like to say my experience, get it out of the way, and then start hitting them with stats and telling them what kind of a problem we have. Another thing on Twitter is I like to refer to her as Senator Claire, but every time I put out a blood clot awareness post, uh, whether it be on Facebook or on Twitter, I always tag her. And uh, later in the year last year, she actually responded to me in one of those posts by saying, you know, I suffered a blood clot. This is about getting people talking. I suffered a blood clot back when I was pregnant 20 years ago. And I said, boy, we really need to get you involved more in women's health when it comes to blood clot prevention. And, you know, it's it's a slow process, sometimes getting them to engage fully. But, you know, I've, I've got her on the track and, and I'm ready to keep hitting that. And without you guys, I would have never been able to focus on my own state senator, Chuck Grassley, or when a congresswoman actually was in the fold, it was like, they helped introduce that blood clot resolution. And it was just so nice to make ties with them because here I'm an Iowan, they were Iowans. And so it was really easy for me to talk to them, but you guys really made it easy and, and it was easy to open up that door. So I'm just really excited about continuing to talk. And Leslie mentioned my passion for grassroots. That's what it's all about for me. I want, I want to put on local events. I want to talk to my local politicians because those grassroots will grow outward and it'll get through to all the right channels. So that's something I'm going to keep on doing. But March is Blood Clot Awareness Month. That is our month to really hit it hard. Um, and like we've been talking about, the National Blood Clot Alliance fully intends on being in Washington, D.C. this March. But uh, and you can recap on anything that you've touched on already, Heidi. It's 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 not a, um, you know, we, we want you to remind people even on the points you've already made. But I want you to maybe tell us, tell everybody what to expect um, if they go to D.C. or when we go to D.C., what can all these people from the blood clot groups and just listening to us socially, what can they do? to support us while we are in Washington, D.C. Maybe they're not going to go to Washington with us, but is there anything that they can do to support us while we're there? Yeah, absolutely, Todd. And here really is why the letter writing process is key. And I know many believe that you write a letter and it goes to a congressional office and just, you know, sort of sits there or gets lost or it's not important. And that is not true. So when you do send a letter, I mean, it gets logged in. It gets a number, it gets assigned to someone, you have to do research. And, and again, I can speak from experience because I, I did have that job on the on the other side for several years um, and, and meeting with folks. And you collect all that information that you're getting from your constituents. And each week you meet with the member of Congress and they say, what kind of letters am I getting? What are we hearing about? What do I need to be paying attention to? And if there are several letters, that certainly does rise to the top. And then, you know, the member of Congress is like, okay, you know, it's not one letter, it's five letters, it's 10 letters, it's 20 letters. Okay, this is something that I need to be paying attention to because that's 20 voters who have that's reached right. out to me and expect me to do something. So yeah. that's how we elevate. And that's why grassroots is so important. And this just isn't limited to Washington, D.C. either. It is the same in the state, and it's the same with your governor, and it's the same with your local members as well. Um, if you don't tell them that there's a problem, they don't think that there's a problem. Yeah, and I know I know Julia just posted the link. You know, we we've made it really easy for people, and Leslie can talk more about this too. But we've made it easy for people to send a note to their representative. Um, so hopefully, I'd like to see everybody follow that link and see what we're talking about. And Leslie can talk more about that too. Yeah, so we have um, it's actually a software system that we bought, and it's a uh, it's a letter that we crafted. And then you can go on the link and tell your um, personal story. You don't have to be a patient. You can be impacted by blood clots in some capacity. You can be a caregiver. You can have a family member or a friend or someone who has been impacted um, by a blood clot. So don't feel as though it's just patients that have to fill this out. But you'll share your personal story. And then it will actually go to the representative in your zip code uh, directly to them in conjunction with them <clears throat> with some information about blood clots, some statistics that Heidi was referring to earlier. So it's super professional, but it tells your story. It tells the story of blood clots. We really need this. We need as many people as possible to participate um, in this exercise. Um, so that's in the chat function. 
if you have a hard time finding it, contact us, info at stoptheclot.org. Call us, get on the website, go to Todd's admin group. We're really happy to share it with you and help you fill it out if you need any assistance. Um, Heidi, we have a bunch of questions, but before we get into the questions, um, we wanted to also, you know, kind of ask you about the, it's not one and done, so to speak. So um, the process itself, you know, I kind of had this uh, idea in my head that we would go into Washington, D.C. and say, we want $100 million for blood clots, and we'd get it. Um, and that's not the way that it works. You actually usually start with a smaller amount of money, but the importance of actually getting into that budget, not necessarily a line item, and maybe you can explain that a little bit, and then how it grows over time. You know, there have been, as you've seen over the uh, course of your career, different health organizations that have started out small and they've grown enormously over time. Uh, kind of walk us through how that process, like what should people expect? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, many, many, again, don't think that their letters are being read or their emails now. Of course, you know, when I worked in Congress, we didn't have email. You had to write a letter um, or phone calls or social media now and, and things like that. I think the, um, the difference here is, is that, unfortunately, in the disease advocacy space, there's a lot of competition. And let's be real, the squeaky wheels get the grease. So you can close your eyes and you can already picture some very large disease organizations that do get significant amounts of money each year for research, for public awareness, education, for um, uh, public awareness, tracking purposes, et cetera. You know, and, and these come to mind a lot in the cancer space, of course, you know, blood, uh, blood cancers, um, breast cancer, you know, um, also diseases that impact children are also very near and dear to members of Congress's heart. They do hear from a lot of their, you know, um, districts, brain cancer, um, you know. So there is a lot of competition. And I think what's challenging for the National Blood Clot Alliance is that blood clots impact everyone. So it's not like we can even get 10 people who look exactly alike and come into an office and say, look at us, we all have, you know, the same thing. So you have to be even louder and you have to be even more, you know, thoughtful and, and more, I don't like to use the term heartbreaking, but again, this impacts everyone. And I guarantee any member of Congress you have a conversation with is like, oh, well, you know, so-and-so had that because they travel a lot. They're constantly on airplanes, you know, so it's something that they may be aware of, but they certainly do not know the head, like the breadth of everybody that this could impact. And that is why more letters need to be sent. And the reason is, is as I mentioned, these get logged in and week by week, you know, the member of Congress is like, who is writing to me? Who is writing to me? What, what do my folks in my district worry about? And if it's, hey, more awareness for blood clots, but guess what? We don't know where to put the money. So we yeah. have to tell them where that goes. And that is what's included in this letter. And that's why it's so important. Because again, if you can go to someone and say, we need, you know, $1 million and it should go here. And this is how it's going to be spent. Then, you know, folks are like, okay, well, that seems reasonable. If you come and say, well, I need a hundred million dollars and this is, you know, terrible. And, you know, you don't have any data, then it may fall on deaf ears because again, a lot of people are buying for the same pot of money each year. Right. Right. And, and, Speaking of money, just let me ask you a question that came in through the chat. You touched on it a little bit, but just to provide some clarity, someone asks, what am I advocating for? Does the money go to the MBCA or does it go to a government agency? Yes. So the money goes to a government agency. So the government agency takes those monies and they dole it out in the way that Congress tells them to. That's why this is important for two reasons. One is you have to tell them how to spend the money and two, you have to give them the money. And those are two different processes, which um, in this year's uh, or in the previous year's omnibus, well, I guess it's this year's fiscal year, <laughs> we, were, we told CDC how to spend the money, but we were not able to get additional monies. So that's what we're gonna focus on 
for the fiscal year 2024, because the federal government is on fiscal year. And that usually happens, um, it gets passed in September. Although as everyone <laughs> can see in the news, that doesn't often happen. This time around it happened in December, which is pretty good for Congress. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the previous year kind of rolled right into April of the following year. So, um, so again, that's sort of how we think about it. We think about it as, you know, Congress is telling the federal agency how to spend the money and they're giving them the monies. Now, it's also important for CDC to have that sense of, well, I can't do it alone. So who is going to be my partner? And gratefully, National Blood Clot Alliance has a very strong relationship with CDC and through, you know, their grant programs have been able to obtain some of those monies to then run NBCA. Yeah, that's a great explanation. So, and I, and I don't like to say run NBCA because again, you are disseminating this information that folks are looking for. And, and, and again, right. CDC can't do that alone. Right. Right. And just to be clear, you know, what we do is we're all about blood clot education and awareness predominantly for the public and for patients uh, or their caregivers, but we also do educate clinicians to a lesser degree, um, but it's all about education and awareness. We're not doing research. This is about education and awareness efforts. Um, okay, so another question for you, Heidi. Uh, should we be asking Congress to support general education and awareness efforts, or do we ask for assistance for things like maternal health or cancer and clots? Who makes that determination as to where the funds go? Yeah, this is a great question because it does get down into those details. So maternal health is very important to several members of Congress um, to really elevate the monies that go to maternal health, given some recent statistics that were released that it's pretty still abysmal here in the U.S. Also, there are several members that are very passionate about cancer care. So how you know what your member of Congress is passionate about is we have these things called caucuses here and a member of Congress based on their interests will join a caucus that you know will advocate for that interest. So for example, there is a congressional caucus for cancer and some of it is you know very specific to specific types of cancer. There's also one that is for preventing cancer and you know that these members of Congress have joined because they either have a personal interest in the issue, or they may have a district issue, or perhaps they have a cancer hospital in their district. So that is a way that we determine what level of interest the member of Congress may have. But interestingly, every member of Congress likes to send money back to their district. So... <laughs> You know, these kinds of funding opportunities is something that members of Congress want to do. It is not something that has always been done in the past, but we're excited that more, um, more congressional involvement is, is uh, being done now and will continue in this next Congress. Hopefully. I, I, I can't Hopefully. say definitely, but as of today. <laughs> we hope so, too. Todd, you want to just we'll yeah, back um, and, and and before we close out in fifteen minutes or so, there's there's two questions I want to make sure I get into you, and one of them is, um, someone had had uh, asked, how can I bring awareness about blood clots to a remote business? Is that something you can touch on? A remote business, um, like a, um. I don't even know what but, that means. Well, and I, I was kind of thinking they were just talking about well, like a company that's not, you know, hooked up with any anybody, just a, just a company in general, maybe their workspace. That's what I got out of it. And I, I have a lot of experience with doing, uh, even before I joined the National Blood Clot Alliance, but the NBCA made it easier, where I was doing lunch and learns at my local company, talking to employees and the people who were managing those employees about how a healthy employee is a productive employee. You need to be telling them about sitting at a desk for too long. And that, that's what I got out of that question. I wasn't sure if you'd get anything else out of that, but I thought they were just talking about how they can arrange uh, to raise, you know, what the process is for raising awareness about blood clots in general, uh, maybe at their company. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's generally done through the human resources process. 
And, and also, um, I would be remiss to say that, you know, many companies often match charitable contributions. So That's if right. there is an opportunity and you're so inclined, um, you know, again, that's also another way uh, to 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 get a, a bigger bang for your buck if you are so inclined to to donate monies to charity. Um, I do think, though, too, um, you know, writing personal experiences about what's happening in your own um, area, like through your hospitals or through your own um engagement with physicians. I do think that's also important because again, members of Congress are in tune in other ways as to who else is getting monies in their district. And they certainly want to, you know, be giving money to those that are, you know, doing things correctly and are treating patients appropriately and, and all that. So this is another way for members of Congress to know what's happening in their district and have a better sense of how these monies are flowing. Sure, sure. I, and I do want to remind everybody that, you know, we, we do have a lot of free resources at the NBCA. And going back to the company and worksite, um, going back to that atmosphere, we, and Leslie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, we still have the new patient resource guides that people just have to pay shipping for, right? And they can actually receive hard copies of these, and they would be able to hand those out not just at their workspace, but more importantly, at uh, like their medical, at their doctor's office. Yes, um, that's absolutely right. So we have a really great new patient resource um, for healthcare providers. If they want to order a whole bunch of them, then they just pay for the shipping. Obviously, for a patient, you never pay for anything at the National Blood Clot Alliance, uh, including shipping. Um, if you don't mind, I have another question that came through that I'd like to, to bring to Heidi's attention. Um, Heidi, do we reach out only to congressional members or do we also reach out to different committees that the members may sit on? Yeah, that is a great question. So generally, I would suggest starting with your member of Congress because, you know, again, you are a constituent and there is a direct relationship. But oftentimes these members of Congress sit on committees that oversee um, different issues. And one of them is public health. So the Committee for um, Energy and Commerce on the House side, and what we call the Senate Health, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pension um, Committee on the Senate side, they do focus and have um, control over, you know, important policy issues impacting public health. So that's one of the great things about the software that Leslie had brought up, because it not only tells you who your member of Congress is, but it does tell you if they sit on the committee. And it's not just those two committees. I would be remiss. You know, there are healthcare issues impacting education and labor committees, as well as just other, you know, veterans committees, also armed services, because this is not just a public health issue. This is an issue for our veterans and, and those who actively serve. Great point. Um, okay. and, and that too is something you can elevate, whether you are an active service member yourself or someone in your family. Again, blood clots tend to happen a lot in these different populations. And so the same that we are talking about monies flowing to the CDC, the same happens with the VA, the same happens with the Department of Defense. And while Department of Defense gets more monies, their money is allocated very similarly as um, other agencies. So it's not like they just get a trillion dollars and they get to spend it in whatever way they want. That's actually a really great point. Um, you know, we met with an organization, it's actually a trauma organization, and they get funding from the Department of Defense and they actually do work on, on blood clots. Um, so trauma associated blood clots, but it actually flows through the Department of Defense. So it's really interesting how all these different committees and groups kind of compete for uh, for funding. Somebody like Kay Granger from I think she's from Texas, isn't she? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. What is what is her role? What does somebody like that do and what influence does she have? Well, you know, it, it's sort of the control of the committee. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have a, a, too much information yet since on the House side, we just got a speaker and we've got, you know, just um, basic administrative functions that we have to go through. But essentially how a committee works 
is you have a chair and you have a ranking member based on whomever party is in um, power, which for the House is Republicans, for the Senate, it is for Democrats. Interestingly, though, both the House and Senate have very, very slim majorities, meaning that they have to work together. So you don't get one vote or you are on a committee or a subcommittee that has you know equal number of members. Again, you're going to need everyone to participate for bills to go through. The appropriations process is a formal process because, again, that is how we fund the federal government, all of it. So all the monies that go through have to go through the same process, but it really is the chair and ranking member who dictate what sort of goes through and what doesn't. And this correlates back to that question around, do I read to send my letters to the committee staff as well? Yes, because it's the committee staffs who are going through all these letters to determine where is, again, the squeaky wheel and who is my boss meaning the member of Congress, going to come to me and be like, why the hell do I keep hearing from these people? What the hell is going on? So again, it's very important to not only educate the member, it's important to educate the staff. And that's what the committee staff do. They're the ones who are going through all the requests to determine what's important. Okay, great. Thank you for that explanation. Um, Todd, do you want to want to take a few others? Yeah. And do you want to be mindful of time? And uh, I'm just going to ask. I'm just going to ask one more question, real quick. And Heidi, you can just touch on it briefly if if you want to touch on it at all. But <clears throat> awareness and education, yes, th those are priority number one. That's what we're focused on. A lot of people are wanting to advocate for specific topics within that. The price of uh, medication is always always a big thing. And one of the questions mm -hmm. that came in was. Uh, can someone advocate for affordability of the newer class of anticoagulants? Is there a certain route that they would go, th you know, a certain process for that that would be separate? How, what, what kind of advice do you have? Yeah, um, you know, it's helpful to be concise in your letters. And if you have several concerns impacting, you know, awareness of blood clots, it is helpful to include it all in one letter. And all of the topics in the letter will be addressed. They don't just choose one and not address the others. Um, I, I'm sure many of you have seen with the Inflation Reduction Act that there has been particular focus on drug prices and how Congress, as well as the federal government, can lower um, prices for Medicare beneficiaries, but also for those in private insurance as well. And believe it or not, there, you know, there is um, uh, a process for Congress to dictate to states as well as to you know public or private insurers as to you know how they cover certain items and and we see that in diabetes with the cost of insulin so there is a lot of legislation around capping insulin costs at a certain dollar amount and very similar to insulin like those of us who have had several clots like Todd and myself we are an, an anticoagulant for the rest of our life so catastrophic coverage the donut hole you know all these kinds of things that not only impact uh, the over 65, as well as those that are on public programs like Medicare and Medicaid, but also impact you, know, you and me too. Yeah. And yes, absolutely, you can advocate on, on those issues as well. Yeah, thanks Heidi. Well, uh, great, great question, great response. So uh, I'm gonna ask one more question. This is a really, really hard one. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with um, uh, us advocating necessarily, but why is there such a lack of education in healthcare, Heidi? Well, um, healthcare is hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, really when, when you think about how the government has interacted on healthcare issues, on public health, as well as Medicare and Medicaid, it is because it's a very antiquated statutory um, land we live in. So as you know, most public health opportunities were solely done at a local level in the states until it really you know, filtered up to um, a federal level. I mean, when you look at the grand scheme of you know, some of our public health entities, I mean, they really came into existence in you know, early 1900s. <laughs> So before the FDA was fully created and, and all that. So it really is just um, healthcare has always been more of a, of a state 
issue and not a federal issue. And of course, as we've grown, population has grown, um, pandemics, endemics, and, and other, you know, public health emergencies have grown. The federal government just has had to step in more and more. And it is why we are so disjointed, because again, the federal government has left a lot of the decision making to the states. And even though the federal government has given states money, you know, not every state has decided to spend it in a way to make sure that their public yeah. health within the state is, you know, robust. And again, COVID really unearthed a lot, yeah. a lot of the, of the, um, of sort of like he said, she said, um, a, uh, a, a great response, very elegant response to a very, very difficult question, uh, at least in my book. Okay. Um, Todd, how about you? Close um, I, you know, I'm, I'm good on questions, but I, I just, I just want you to know, Heidi, Leslie and I, uh, thank you so much for joining us and Absolutely. not only sharing how to advocate, but also your own personal story as a patient, because like you said, there's nothing stronger than that patient story, that patient voice. We want people to keep sharing and we want them to, to, you know, share that story with the right people. Uh, we would not be here without you and your team. Um, I've enjoyed working with your team over the over last year, and I'm very excited about 2023. Um, I'm just thankful for all that you've done for us and the patient community. And we also want to remind people, and it's here in the chat, that link to sign up and share your story with your congressperson. We've made it really easy for you. You guys love sharing your stories. I wanna see as many of you uh, do this as possible because the NBCA does need your help. We need to save maximum lives and you can definitely be a part of that. If we're gonna make a difference, it's gonna take all of us working together to stop the clot. That's what this is all about. So Heidi, thank you so much and looking forward to working with you more this year. Well, thank you so much. and. If I could just um, end with one, one issue that we did not talk about, and it's sort of the reverse, you know, educating your member of Congress, if someone else in the district should unfortunately have an issue with a blood clot and reach out to their member of Congress, your story could prompt that staffer to be like, oh, I, I know someone else. I, I, I've heard this story. I know what you're talking about. And this is how I can help. And they can engage sooner again, saving lives. So that's why this is important. It is a two-way. And I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to my colleagues, Kendall Hussey and Julie Nolan, who also work tirelessly and make me look good um, in, in, in this effort as well. So, and Sean Feely. So it, it's not just me, it does take a village and we need your village to help our village so that we can stop the plot. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks guys, this was great. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, all. Good Thank night. you for joining us. Bye-bye.